let's see, what did we talk about last time? Um, so last time we did our little like, you know, historical overview, a brief history of classical mechanics and stuff. We did, talked about like a little bit of Newtonian stuff. So sort of like, you know, a little appetizer. We talked about uh, coordinate invariance kind of ideas. And we'll talk about that some more at some point. But the, the big takeaway was that F equals MA is not coordinate invariant, which makes it a giant pain to do things in not Cartesian coordinates, which turns out to be super annoying in a lot of cases, including things as simple as a pendulum. Okay, so what are we doing today? Today we're gonna get into some of the like simulation side of the uh, dynamics and simulation stuff and kind of talk about a few different things. So first thing we're gonna talk about is state space, which is probably at least anyone who's taken like a some kind of controls or linear systems class is acquainted with this idea. And we're gonna talk about uh, Euler integration, which is the dumbest sort of, uh, ODE integration you can do. And I will hopefully uh, convince you today that you should never, ever do it, ever. Just stop. It's bad for you. Uh, so we'll talk about why in a sort of, you know, drawn out theoretical way that should hopefully convince you once and for all that it's terrible. Uh, we're going to talk about energy stuff. And we're going to talk about Lyapunov stability. To sort of close us out, hopefully at the end. That is the the to do list for today. So here we go. Um, any questions about anything from last time or logistics or anything this time? So um, Anthony sent out a bunch of stuff on. Oh, so a couple of comments. One is this stuff's always streamed on Zoom. So if you're in a bind or whatever and you can't make it, that's cool. I post them on YouTube. Also, that was posted on the Slack, um, and the lecture notes are on GitHub. Blah blah blah. So hopefully you found all that. Um, I think that should do it for now. And then, yeah, definitely check out. So Andy posted some like how-to stuff for getting set up for the homeworks. Specifically, we're gonna use GitHub Classroom, which involves, if you use Gitbahor, it's not a big deal, but you need a GitHub account for sure. And basically there's like a template repo that we'll post that's the assignment. And you have to like clone it yourself and then like make your own and then do your thing. And then there's sort of a whole submission process that invo involves tagging a release out of your repo. It's fairly straightforward. There's a how-to guide. Check it out because, uh, you know, you're going to have to do it like next week or something. Um, so yeah, Git. And then the other comment is that we use Julia for everything in this class, which will be sort of unfamiliar to many of you. It's basically MATLAB. So if you've used MATLAB before, you'll be fine. It's also extremely similar to Python. It's, it's not a big deal. I think you guys can handle it. Um, okay. That's, that's, and I'll give you lots of example code. We're going to basically have like Jupyter Notebook demos in every class. So like you should have enough to sort of copy paste and figure it out. It shouldn't be too bad. Okay. So let's get it going. So first sort of thing to know about is what, what is this state space idea? So first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to sort of um, recall the pendulum from last time that we spent a long time deriving, which is everyone's favorite nonlinear system. Uh, so here it is. That's a minus sign there. So this is like the second order ODE that we ended up with last time after our whole conversation about coordinates and, you know, all that F equals MA stuff. So this is, as we all hopefully know, um, a second order Uh, ordinary differential equation. Second order refers to the fact that there's two time derivatives in there, right? There's a double dot. And we can write it like this. So like any second order ODE, right? We, we have an equation that can be arbitrary, you know, nonlinear, whatever. That's a function of theta and theta dot. So like uh, position and velocity in general. This doesn't have a, any velocity dependence, but it could, like if I added damping, right? Then you get a theta dot term that's legal. So it's a, uh, basically an equation that tells us what the second derivative of the pose or configuration is in terms of the first two, right? 
Um, so yeah, another way of saying this is to predict the system forward in time, I need to know both theta and theta dot to like specify initial conditions, right? That's the stuff I need to sort of uniquely define the state of the system and to be able to predict, right? And, and state is here means like literally all the bits of information you need to know to predict the what's going to happen at the next instant in time. That's what we mean by state. It's all the information you need to be able to predict. Okay. So you need theta and theta dot to do any predicting. Um, the idea here is let's just combine those into a single vector. And this we call the state because it sort of, you know, for obvious reasons, it's everything you need to know about the system. So we're going to stack these together in one big X. And then we can rewrite these dynamics as a first order set of equations, right? So in terms of the state, it's just x dot because that includes the theta dot and the theta double dot inside it. And you can always write, you can write any ODE of any order as a, you can always write it as a first order vector uh, ODE. So that's worth knowing. That's sort of the standard thing. And basically what you do to do that, right, is if there are any higher derivatives, you just stack them inside of the state, right? And uh, there are definitely systems where you need more derivatives than this. Anyone have any good examples of that? Like any systems where you go past second derivatives to like do dynamics? Anyone taking a vibrations or structures class? No? Yeah? Beams? No, more like uh, yeah, so it turns out to, to do beams, like the classic, you know, Euler-Bernoulli beam, those are fourth order. You go up to the fourth derivative of like the, yeah, so it, it happens. There are systems, but same deal. You can stack up now. You have like, you know, one through four derivatives stacked up and you can still write the equations out like this. Okay. So... So we can always do this. You can always write them in this first order form. And um, why do we do this? Uh, there, basically, this lets you, this is the form that all numerical ODE solvers use. And it lets you basically standardize. So like you can write now a ton of different algorithms that can all just eat a function of that form. And that's all you've ever got to worry about. So pretty much every numerical ODE solver, if you can write it like that, then you can just plug it in and it works. So you pretty much, you know, in your life, you will you will have to do this at some point, right? So you do whatever you have to do to get ODEs, and then you stack everything up into that form so you can like feed it into a solver in a computer. Okay, cool. So questions about any of that? Super straightforward. People have seen this before, hopefully. Okay, so now we're gonna do our first, we'll put it in quotes, simulator. So we're gonna um, you know, basically the, the message is, which I'm sure people have heard before. We almost never can actually solve these ODEs in closed form. I mentioned last time as an aside that you actually can for the nonlinear pendulum, which most people don't know about, but in general, you can't. And it's easy to break that, right? So if you do have a system with a closed form solution, if you do any little tweak or perturbation to it, you, you break the closed form solution. So like those things are like vanishingly rare and like they, you know, for all practical purposes, you can basically assume they don't exist because they like are so rare and so fragile that they're almost useless. They're like fun little things. They're like collector's items, right? Like analytic solutions to ODEs. They're like little little nuggets that you collect. And it's like a fun fact to know about, but you almost never get to use them. Uh, 
Um, so can almost never do that. So we need numerical methods. So on to the, the simplest and dumbest numerical method for solving ODEs. This is called the explicit uh, Euler method. There's actually three different Euler methods. And they're, this is the worst one. The other two are slightly less terrible, um, but they're still terrible. We will talk about them. Okay, so the idea is simple, right? So you've got, so X is this, is X of T, right, is the trajectory of the system. I have an equation that tells me X dot, AKA the tangent line to that curve. So all I'm gonna do is take X dot and go a little bit along that tangent line, right? And then I'm gonna evaluate F of X again. I'll get a new tangent and I can go along that direction. So I can like lie the tangent in little tiny steps, right? So writing that out mathematically, I get, xk plus one, so some you know future time. Um, so maybe I'll write this out like more explicitly. So xk plus one, we're going to write as x at tk plus h, where h is our little time step. This is so we're going to write this out like approximately. <clears throat> This is approximately xk plus h times x dot. So I, if I know some starting point xk, I have this tangent. I'm going to take a little step of length h along the tangent where h is the time step, right? And then this is just xk plus h f of xk. And the idea here is, you know, this is approximating this curve with these little tangent steps, right, which are straight lines. So we want that time step. If it's a curvy thing and I'm approximating with a bunch of little straight lines, I want this to be small. If it's big, I'm going to step way off the curve, right? I'm going to sort of do, so maybe we draw this. So here's my, like, let's say this is the X of T if I, if I could know it, right? And let's say, you know, right here we've got like X not, let's say, you know, so what I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to take x dot here, which will be some like little tangent line, and I'm going to step along this by some distance h. So that might get me, you know, here, say, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get a new tangent line. I'm going to step along at some distance h and end up here, right? So that's kind of the intuition. So this might be like x1, x2, dot, dot, dot. And these guys are this would be like, you know, f of x naught, f of x1 over here. Cool. Okay. So let's write that. Okay, question about that, super easy. Pretty much everyone's seen this before, I imagine. Okay, so now we're gonna do it. Let's see what happens. So has everybody in here used Jupyter before? At least like in Python and stuff, most people, yeah. Um, so this is Jupyter, Jupyter Lab or whatever. It's the same as Python, but you can also do Julia in it. Um, here's code. So I'll post these on the GitHub. Um, this first line is uh, setting up packages. So like this little, this manifest and project file um, keeps a record of every package I've used in my little notebook. And by including this in the top line, if you go download this and you just run that top line, it'll automatically install any packages that you need to run this in the exact same versions that I used. So there shouldn't be any weird versioning or package issues, which is awesome. This is one of the big reasons I love Julia. Um, the other comment on this is that we're going to use the long-term support release of Julia in this class for the semester, just because it's easier. 
The newest version is 1.8, but there's some weird issues with Apple Silicon, and I have an Apple Silicon Mac, and it crashes a lot. So boo. So we're going to use this version, Julia 1.6.7, which is the long-term support release. Just download that. Don't download the latest, greatest 1.8, because it will. If you have a Mac, it will. It will not play nice. Uh, okay. So cool. Um, packages. Pyplot is the same. Uh, it's matplotlib from Python. If you've used that before, same one. Um, here's our dynamics. So we're going to do the pendulum thing. This is exactly the stuff we just wrote down, right? So um, this is the state, theta dot on top, theta double dot on the bottom. And here's my dynamics that we got last time, q over l sine theta. I'm going to just set the length to one meter, mass to one kilogram, and g, you know, standard gravity. All good. And then, yeah, the dynamics are getting x dot. Um, yeah, pretty much it. I mean, that's all good. All right, so I'm, I'm going to pull out theta and theta dot from my vector and then stack up x dot. Cool. That's easy. Um, here's our Euler step that we just wrote down, right? So next x equals xk plus h times x. Super simple. And then this is just a for loop that's going to run through the simulation for m steps. Okay, here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to simulate for 10 seconds at 20 hertz. Um, so I'm just computing how many time steps n that is. And I'm going to set some initial conditions. So my initial conditions are like 30 degrees and no initial velocity, just sitting there at 30 degrees. So it's going to you know, do its thing, right? Cool. So we run that simulate. Uh, another Julia comment. When I put an X, this is a convention in Julia. If you put an exclamation point at the end of your function, it means that it's um, in place, which means it's modifying the arguments. So what this is doing, I'm passing in this X traj array, and then inside the function, it's writing into the array. So it's not returning you know, something back. It's actually, you're, you're passing in a big empty array and it's filling the array inside the function. You do that because it doesn't allocate memory. It's just filling stuff that you've already allocated. So it's like more efficient. This is a standard thing in Julia. Uh, okay, here's fun stuff. So we're going to now like animate this. There's a package called Meshcat that we use a bunch and we will use it. It's fun. Uh, so now I can like watch my pendulum go and we'll see what happens here. So what do we expect to happen? Start at 30 degrees, nothing else going on. We expect to just swing back and forth forever, right? There's no damping. It should just do this. All right, let's see what actually happens. So that looks benign. Let's watch it for a little while. What's happening? That's that seems wrong. So what's going on there? You don't have any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, so there's definitely energy getting pumped into the system, right? And we talked about how, like, you know, this thing is like doing this little tangent curve thing, and we need those steps to be small for it to be a, a reasonable approximation. So I don't know. I mean, what should we do? Should we like try making the time step smaller? What do you think? Does that seem like a reasonable idea? So let's plot this too. We can like plot, you know, x and t. So clearly, this is like doing crazy things and blowing up on us, right? Okay. So I don't know. What what should we do to fix this? Thoughts? You want to try making the time step smaller? How small? How small should I go? I'm going to do 100 hertz. But I don't know. Pick a number. 100 hertz. Let's try 100 hertz. See what happens. We'll do this again. So it's better, but it's still gaining energy, right? So, um, and yeah, it'll blow up, whatever. Uh, we want to go crazy. We can do 1,000 hertz. We can do a kilohertz. So it's definitely going to be better. But if you look closely at this, it's still growing, right? So the kind of obvious conclusion is like empirically here, I can make that H arbitrarily small. All it's going to do is, is like stave off the inevitable. It's still going to blow up eventually if you let it sit there for long enough. The smaller you make H, the lower the rate of this energy blow up will be, but it's still going to happen. I can make that as small as I want. And as you make it smaller and smaller and smaller, your simulation gets more and more expensive, right? Like you're taking more F evaluations. So that's also bad and inefficient and stuff like that. And on some basic level, it's like the dynamics of this thing are not fast, right? They're order like one hertz. So I shouldn't really, in some like Nyquist sense, I shouldn't really have to sample that fast, right? Like sampling at 10 or 20 hertz should be perfectly adequate to capture the dynamics of this thing, right? So there's something like deeply flawed with Euler integration is sort of the obvious conclusion from this, right? Oh yeah, we can also plot just for fun. We'll do this later, but plot the total energy, right? So this is at a kilohertz and you can see 
it's still like total energy is obviously increasing, right? Okay. Any other, anyone try anything else here? You want anything else? Thoughts, comments, questions, other fun ideas? Try. No, we good? Could we damp it? You could damp it. Sure. What do you think that'll do? I mean, so, so in theory, like I could like figure out exactly the rate of energy increase that's happening here as like a function of H and like artificially add damping to the system to try to like cancel that out, right? That's actually something that people do. It's a terrible, terrible thing to do, but almost all the stock robotic simulators that you're used to, Bullet, Mujoko, et cetera, all do that. They all add artificial damping to the simulators uh, to prevent this blow up phenomena from happening, just so things don't look stupid. Because they will do this because they're using Euler integration, which <laughs> is awful. Uh, is the system have to be super known in order to do that? So the, the bottom line is you shouldn't do that. That's a terrible hack that like you shouldn't be doing. But a lot of it's it's a very frustratingly common hack that almost all the stock robotic simulators do because they'd rather have artificial damping than have the systems blow up and look stupid. So it's a very common move, but inaccurate and bad and whatever. And welcome to the sim to real gap. That's uh, okay, cool. So I will stop. Is there a reason it's useful? Uh, there are some technical reasons, but mostly it's because they don't know better. <laughs> I would argue <laughs> there are better things to do, but no, I mean, there are, there are reasons why it's, it's like, there are specific things in these simulators, uh, namely contact mechanics where you have impacts and stuff where it's not super obvious how to do things with impacts, uh, with higher order integration. It gets really, really gnarly. Um, so the standard methods for doing non-smooth dynamics are first order. That's kind of why, and there are it's it's super hard to do, not first order in that context. Okay, cool. Let's try some other stuff. Uh, okay, so let us summarize what we just saw. So, so first thing is. Quite obviously, simulations can produce unphysical behavior. As just like a practical matter, um, like, and, and when I say unphysical, I mean like, not just that there's like some error, right? Which there's always gonna be like discretization error, blah, blah, blah. I mean like fundamental like structural things that you know, common sense tells us these things should do, these things will violate. They will change structural properties of the system, right? Um, so like here, right, we took something that should have been stable over long time scales and it made it unstable. So you can like, you know, have stable equilibria become unstable and vice versa. You can have like equilibria disappear, like all kinds of weird things that like are deeply wrong can happen. <laughs> And so it's, you should really, really sanity check these things. Like, even if you're using fancy tools, like you should always run like very basic sanity check things, like check energy, like things that should be conserved, check those, right? That kind of stuff. And yeah, the last one is you should probably never use explicit Euler. I think there are two, two lessons that you absolutely must learn from this class. One is this. The other one is never use Euler angles for rotations. Those are the two things. I, if I get nothing else through to you, those are the two things. All right, cool. Uh, let's talk about energy a little bit. So I made that energy plot, right? Let's talk about that. Um, so everybody knows what energy is, at least. Yeah. 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 Like, when you're discretizing, um, or when you're taking, yeah, when you're discretizing the linear system, it's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's actually different. 
Um, so there's there's so linear systems are the major special case of ODEs where we always know the exact solution. Right. So there you can actually get the exact solution to as many decimal places as you want. And these concerns that we just mentioned like kind of go away to a large extent um, if you're using the exact solution, right? Which you can still plug those things into like something like this and get stupid answers. But there, you know, the exact solution. The zero order hold thing is actually super reasonable most of the time because it's what we actually do on our robots, right? Mm -hmm. If we're running a digital control system, it's running at some sample rate and you're putting out like some motor torque over some sample time. So that is zero order hold, right? So the reason we do that is, is actually that it's pretty physical. Like it's basically what a DAC does, right? Uh, in real life. So that's super. So if you run your zero to hold thing at the sample rate of the DAC on your actual robot, like that's right. You know what I mean? So there's, um, there are other things you can do, right? You can do fancier, like smooth things, um, like first order hold, but you linearly interpolate. You can put a spline in there and smooth it out. Um, so that makes sense if you have like an analog controller, right? If you have a real analog, like PID loop with like op amps and stuff, that's actually generating analog continuous voltages, then something like that might make sense to use a smooth interpolant, but like using a digital control loop, which almost, you know, like everything is now, zero holds actually like the right thing. Okay, cool. Anything else? All right. Um, okay, cool. So energy, everyone should know about this. This is like, you know, basic stuff, but um, let's do a quick, cause we're gonna sort of use some of these ideas in some, some depth. So it's scalar. <laughs> and comes in two basic flavors. <clears throat> so we have kinetic energy, which is how much I'm moving. <clears throat> and that um, we write down as T and for a particle, like we've been talking about in the, the Newton thing, right? It's, and in, you know, RN, where you have vectors for everything, it looks like this. It's actually always a quadratic function of the velocity, uh, regardless of like how gnarly your coordinates are and stuff. It's always a quadratic function of velocity. So it always has the form of like a quadratic form. In more complicated, nasty situations, basically the little m becomes a mass matrix big M that can be a function of the pose or, or configuration. Um, and then it becomes like a V transpose MV situation, but for particles, it looks like that for them, the scalar. So that's kind of, but it always, it always is a quadratic function. Um, and we'll, we'll do more of that. Okay. The other kind is potential energy. And this is like how much I could move say based on where I am. So intuitively, this is like if you're sitting on top of a hill and I give you a little nudge, you can you can move a lot. So whereas if I'm sitting on like flat ground and everything's flat around me, not gonna move very much. Okay, so this, so like the simple one would be the one we all, you know, we write this as U and like say we write gravity is mg times the height. And let me write that in here. This is kind of shorthand. Uh for a constant gravity. Uh, let's see. So yeah, like what you can do with this, right? To sort of drive that point home is let's take the example of uh, a particle with n equals one that falls uh, some some distance delta z equals one meter, say, uh, from rest. Then um, the change in potential energy, so like delta u is going to be we'll put m m g z. The change in u is just g here, so minus g. I'm going down, right? And then the system's conservative, like if energy is conserved, 
that has to basically go into uh, kinetic energy. So I'm going to gain T equals G kinetic energy. And so I can actually then figure out T equals G now. This is one half M V squared. I can actually solve for V after following me to right. So we trade back and forth. Uh, what else? Yeah, I don't know. I think that's, that's kind of the idea. Everyone kind of knows about this. Um, we have, so in general, kinetic energy, it's always quadratic in the velocity. And it also can be a function of, uh, of position or pose, right? Or configuration, whatever you want to call it. Potential energy is only a function of configuration, pose, position, whatever you want to call it. Never a function of velocity. So. That's it. Okay. All good there. Everybody knows this stuff, I think. Um, so, and then we've got the total energy. We add these things together. And last sort of uh, comment on this is that, so we have this potential thing. We just saw, you know, we can trade energy back and forth. We can take potential energy and convert it to kinetic energy and blah, blah, blah. So sort of unsurprisingly, you know, if we think about that a little bit more, you can actually calculate forces from a potential. And in general, this looks like F equals minus grad U. And that kind of makes sense, right? So looking at the gravity case, the force due to gravity is minus mg, right? In the z direction, we know that. If I take the gradient of mg, you know, minus is, is mg, minus mg, right? So that kind of makes sense. And kind of intuitively, right? Like if I'm trading between kinetic energy and potential energy in this kind of way, like if I fall, right? Like how does, how do I jack up T? It's at the end of the day, I'm pushing on this thing, right? With some force to increase the, the kinetic energy. So this is kind of, I don't know, another interpretation of this. And that's that's basically the like differential version of trading energy back and forth between kinetic and potential, right? If I were to write down that conservation equation and like take its time derivative basically and balance those things out, this is kind of what would pop out. Uh, so let's like just another example, right? Um, for like a spring. So we saw gravity. Uh, so sort of obviously the force from a spring is minus kx, right? We all know that. And that's equal to minus, say, grad of some u spring, right? So based on this, what is the potential for, uh, for a spring have to be that comes out to minus kx? Yeah. in 1D. Okay, so there's only certain kinds of forces though that we can write as a potential, basically ones that are only dependent on position. So uh, there's some caveats to that, but that's basically the story right? because the potential can only depend on position, not on velocity. So, Any force that you can derive from potential potential is called uh, are called conservative uh, because they don't change the total energy of the system. Any conservative force, if you like plug it into this whole setup, right? All you can do is trade energy back and forth between kinetic and potential. The energy is still there. Uh, whereas if you have, so if you think about this, right, what's like the main kind of force we think about that isn't conservative? Drag damping, these kind of things, friction. 
all of those depend on velocity, right? They're all kind of proportional velocity, velocity squared, something like that. So just by, by that fact alone, they can't be written as some gradual potential because they are velocity dependent. And that velocity dependence basically is, is the key thing here that like sort of says it's influencing the, um, the, the total energy. And so it's not conservative. Okay. Say. Yeah, so friction. <laughs> Those are all non conservative. Incidentally, there is sort of a potential like thing for, for non-conservative forces that looks like a potential and like you can derive the force from the gradient of this thing, but it's not, so it's a little non-standard and weird. Uh, I don't know if we're gonna talk about that either. It's called a Rayleigh dissipation function, if you're curious. So it lets you kind of also deal with these non-conservative forces in like potential like way, kind of fun. Okay, cool. Any questions about that? Now we're gonna actually use this energy stuff to like get at some of these stability things and why Euler's equation sucks so bad and stuff like that, <laughs> or Euler, Euler integration. Okay, so let's do that. So what we're gonna do now is this. Um... Talk about Lyapunov stability. Uh, who's heard of this before? A decent number of you, okay. Let's do some stuff. Okay, so what we're gonna do right now is look at the pendulum's energy. So let's maybe just draw this thing real quick again to ground our notation and stuff. So we got M, L, we got theta here, and what else? That's it, and we got G, the usual thing. So we've got kinetic energy for this guy is one half M, V dot V, if we're using like these kind of like abstract, you know, vector things in terms of theta stuff. Um, so I can figure this out by like, you know, if I wanted to, I could write, you know, uh, I could write this thing out in Cartesian coordinates using the coordinate transformations, right? And find like X dot Y dot and then convert that to polar or whatever. Uh, I trust that you guys have done that before and or know how to do it. So we'll skip all that and just write this out. So that's what that is in polar coordinates, right? And then the potential energy in this case is MGZ, say, whatever. And if I do the sort of coordinate transform -y stuff there, I get MGL one minus cos theta. Okay, so now if I add these together to get the total energy, there are no surprises here. Okay, so we talked about how this is a conservative system, right? AKA conserves energy, AKA like it's just trading back and forth kinetic potential. So this E is a constant, right? We hope it's not when we did Euler integration, but it should be. So let's look at, so, okay, so E is constant. That means E dot, if I take the time derivative of E, it's gotta be zero, right? We want that to happen. So let's do that. Let's look at that. So let's do T dot. So this is going to be, you know, basically T is a function of theta dot. So I'm going to chain rule it. I'm going to do partial T, partial theta dot times DDT of theta dot, which is theta double dot, which is AKA our dynamics, right? I'm going to get that. So I'm going to take partial T, partial theta, and then I'm going to plug in the dynamics for theta dot. So I'm going to get M L, um, Oh, did I mess this up? This is an L squared, my bad. ML squared theta dot 
times theta double dot, which I'm going to go plug in dynamic. So that's minus q over L sine theta. And if I kind of just then simplify this down, I'm going to get minus m g l sine theta theta dot. Cool. Now we're going to do the same thing for u. So here it's going to be u depends on theta. So I'm going to chain rule it. I'm going to do partial u, partial theta, and then d theta dt, also known as theta dot. And if I go ahead and do that, right? We're going to go cos theta, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to get MGL sine theta, theta dot. And so unsurprisingly, if I add these together to get E dot, I get zero. So that tells us energy is conserved, blah, blah, blah. No surprises. Okay, so here's some more fun stuff based on this idea. Okay, so um, based on this idea, E dot equals zero, I can actually now bound the motion of this thing for all time in the state space. So like, let's do that. So basically if I like, you know, run this backwards, if I, if I were to like invert this E dot equals zero equation, uh, or the actually the E equals constant equation, right? So E equals constant. That's uh, if I were to like solve that backwards, I could actually derive like some curve of constant energy in the state space. And I can bound where the system can go for all time because of this cons conservation thing, right? So let's kind of think about that. So let's see, um, what are we gonna do? We're gonna do like, so say given some E naught at T equals zero, let's look at the kinetic energy. We've got this sort of thing. I can now basically solve this for like, what theta dot of T for all time, like norm of this guy has to always be less than or equal to, if I basically you know, solve this the other way, uh, two over ML squared E naught, right? So that's like, if all of my energy were kinetic energy, so T equals E naught, so I plug in E naught for T and I just solve this the other way for theta dot squared, take square root. This tells me, if I know what the initial energy is at the beginning of this, Theta dot can never get any bigger than this, right? Because that's the it's if it's all kinetic, that's the, the biggest velocity you can ever get. And we'll write this with fancy math notation. This is for all for all time. Okay, cool. Uh, so that's we can bound the velocity now for all time. If we use the U equation, we can do the same thing for the positions. So if I write out this guy, one minus cos, and do the exact same thing. I plug in, let's say it's all potential energy. So I plug in E naught for U and just invert this equation. I get, can bound this guy. So this is like a cos inverse E naught over m g l minus one same thing for all time that's kind of cool right that's like a pretty it's actually a pretty powerful result right it's like just knowing the initial conditions i can calculate this energy and i can tell you there's some region in the state space that this thing can never leave it's always going to be bounded inside some set so that idea um it turns out is like extremely valuable and super useful in control theory 
right? You can guarantee stability and stuff like this and safety regions. There's all kinds of ideas based on this. Uh, if anyone's heard of like control barrier functions and way off and off control, there's all kinds of things that use this to guarantee safety. This is basically how you guarantee safety on controllers on robots by doing stuff like this. Um, so, when a system is guaranteed to stay within some some region or set or whatever you want to call it, we call it Lyapunov stable. And we can sort of generalize this idea and sort of make it a little bit more, you know, strict or whatever. So if I, if I, the general statement, like the formal statement, So here's the sort of like general version. If we can find a function V of X from the state space, which we'll say is Rn here to R. So it's a scalar valued function of the state, AKA looks like energy, right? Um, that has the following property. So one, it's got V of X has to be greater than equal to zero for all X. So that's saying, yeah, it's gotta be, the, the fancy way of saying it is it has to be positive semi-definite. So it can never be negative. It's always non-negative. So that's true of energy, right? You can't have negative energy. So these are all just formalizing like intuitive things about energy basically uh, for all X. And then you also have that, V of zero has to equal zero. So it, can, it has to be positive everywhere except the origin where it can be zero. Two is that V of X has to go to infinity as, uh, as X goes to infinity. As, so norm of X fits a vector. So they have to kind of both blow up. Basically what this is saying is that the, the V can't like plateau, right? It has to sort of keep growing as you go out. And then the last one is, so yeah, the first two basically say that V looks like a bowl. If you want to think about this intuitively, it says it's zero at the, at the bottom. And as you go out, uh, it's got to be always positive and it has to keep growing as you go further out. So it's got to grow out forever. Can't flatten out bowl. It can be a weird shaped bowl, but it's got to be like a bowl thing. And then this next one is the key one, V dot of X, which is equal to grad V times the dynamics, right? This is just chain ruling, right? To find V dot, it's grad V with respect to X times X dot. This thing has to be negative or negative semi-definite, aka non-positive for all X. So what that's saying is, so in terms of the motion, right? So we've set this up as a bowl. So this is a big bowl. And this is saying that trajectories of the system have to always go downhill in the bowl. That's what this means, right? So the motion is always headed down the bowl. Oh, uh, I, missed, I missed a zero there. So this is, yeah, less than or equal to zero. So there's some subtlety here. So less than zero, strictly less than, means you're always headed downhill, right? Equal to zero, sort of edge case, that means you're staying at the same height on the bowl. And that's actually the conservative case, right? Where we have, so like negative here would be you have damping, right? Like you're losing energy. The equal zero case is the conservative case. That's where you stay in this bounded region, but you never, so if it's strictly less than, that means you're always headed to the bottom of the bowl. So you're, you're gonna converge to strictly to the bottom. If it's if it can equal zero in some spots, that means you, you'll stay bounded. You won't grow, but you might stay in some region forever and never actually get all the way to the bottom of the bowl. Okay, so if these three things are true, we say the system is stable about the origin. 
since I wrote all this stuff down relative to like, you know, x equals zero. Um, this is still super general because you can basically just move the origin around to anywhere you want. So if you want to do this at some other point, you just use like a change of coordinates. So yeah, if I have some other point, I can do sort of new coordinates, x tilde equal x minus x star, just make x star the new origin, right? And then this all still works as is. Uh, okay, and then the, the point I just made about the kind of the subtle stuff. So v dot, if v dot equals zero, this is called Lyapunov stable. So that's the case of the undamped pendulum where it stays bounded for all time, but doesn't sort of necessarily converge to the origin. And then the case where we have v dot strictly less than zero, this is called asymptotically stable. Because asymptotically as t goes to infinity, this says that it's gonna get to the bottom of the bowl. So let's draw the picture. So we've got, say, our, so for the pendulum, right, we've got like our coordinates are uh, theta, theta dot. And we have this big bowl. Let me try to draw this. Let's see. It's a pretty crap bowl. Sorry. Let me try that again. It's a slightly better bowl. Uh, okay, so. And then we've got, say, our trajectory over here. You know, maybe is winding down the bowl, something like that. Cool. There's the picture that I, that seems reasonable. Okay. Sort of okay. That's the intuition. That's the picture. And so in general, the challenge is you have to find the V, right? The problem with this whole game is that in general, so for simple systems, you can just use total energy and that works out. But for more complicated gnarly things, you generally like have to find a V that works. And that can be really, really hard in general. Okay, so let's go back to our pendulum thing one more time and look at pendulum with Euler integration. So we looked at it in continuous time where we just did E dot, right? And showed in continuous time, absolutely Lyapunov stable, right? E dot equals zero conserves, blah, blah, blah. And we could bound the motion. We computed some bounds in the state space that the thing's not allowed to leave. Um, we can do the same stuff in continuous or in discrete time. Which sometimes is convenient, right? If you've already got some like discrete dynamics thing or whatever. Um, so you can do it either way, but in, so in, in continuous time, we looked at E dot, right? In discrete time, we're going to look at Delta E over a uh, time step or, you know, or Delta V we up on a function instead of E dot or V dot, the sort of continuous time version. So this is super straightforward. So what we're gonna do is the exact same stuff. We're gonna compute delta T K, which is gonna be T K plus one minus T K. And I'm literally just gonna plug in, you know, 
to the, the discrete time dynamics. So here's the, the kinetic energy stuff. And it was theta dot squared, right? So the, the delta is And then delta UK, same deal, UK plus one minus UK. And I'm just going to plug in to this whole thing. And I'm going to get cos theta K minus cos theta K plus one. Just looking at it was, it's one minus cos theta, right? So I plug these things in and subtract. That's what I get, right? Okay. Now I'm just going to plug in the discretized Euler integrated dynamics for uh, for theta k plus one, theta dot k plus one, right? So I've got this. So the first line is theta k plus h theta dot k. The second line is theta dot k plus one plus h or minus, sorry, minus h times g over l sine theta k. Cool. So we go ahead and plug this stuff in. So we're going to get now, um, I, know, I wrote this wrong. Is it delta is not grads. Okay, so I get delta TK equals one half ML squared. This is a little bit messy, but you know, not because I've got to square this whole thing. So I will write it out and don't worry about like copying this or whatever. Okay, so that's the whole thing expanded out. There's some canceling that's gonna happen here, right? This guy, this guy cancel out. So the mess inside there is the rest. And I can simplify this a tiny bit and get, pull some stuff out. So I get minus H M G L sine theta K theta dot K plus one half H squared M G squared sine squared theta K. Cool, that's the whole thing. Now we're gonna do it for delta U. Um, so here's, this one's a little tricky. So here's what I get if I just plug everything in. Okay, so here's a key move. I'm going to take, to get this to work out nicely, there's some like hand wavy I'm going to do here, but it'll, this will get like more rigorous in a, in a bit. What we're going to do is, um, so this is cos theta k, this is cos theta k plus my, my tiny times step h guy right here, right? So I'm going to tailor expand this one in h. So assuming we're taking a small time step. And then actually this is a best case. Uh, I'm assuming h is really small. So that's best case, right? And the limit of really tiny h, this will be true. So let's do that. So that, that term becomes then, uh, actually, it's, I'm just going to do the second term, and I'll write what the second term is, and then it's become clear, right? So I'm going to Taylor expand that about uh, theta k. So I'm going to get a cos theta k up front, and these guys are going to cancel, right? And then I'm just going to get a term proportional to h left over. And so it's just cos theta k, and then the first derivative, which is sine theta k times the term proportional to h. So that's h theta dot k. Cool. And then this <laughs> minus this goes cancels out. I just get that term. Okay, so now, uh, so this whole thing right then is m, oh, sorry. h m g l sine theta k theta dot 
Okay. Okay. Now we're going to put this all together. So take a quick look, right? So this term matches this term. So those cancel out, right? When I add these back together to do total energy. And then the only thing left over is this term over here, right? The H squared term. So let's write that out. So I get delta E K equals, uh, let's just do them upside down deltas. So delta T K plus delta U K. And if I add those together, we only get that. The first two terms cancel out and I get this term left. Okay, what can I say about that thing? Can I say something about the sign of that term? It's always positive because M's positive and everything else is squared, right? So this term is always, always positive. And that means that for every single time step, I'm always adding this much energy, which is terrible. And that's telling you like, no matter what you do, you can make h as small as you want. This thing's proportional about h squared. So like if I make h small, this is squared small, but we just did it at a kilohertz on a really benign system, right? And this is, so this is, you know, maybe kind of minus six in that case, but it's still gonna blow up. No matter what you do, no matter how small you make the time steps, Euler integration will always blow up. Uh, okay, that's, let's see, can we do the rest of this story now? This maybe should wait till next time. The rest of the story. This is that's probably a good day. Let's see what's next time. I'm not sure. We got like three minutes. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait. This is a good stopping point. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can do this next time. Okay, cool. Uh, that we open off stability. You can do it in discrete time. You can do it in continuous time. Uh, Euler integration is terrible. It will always add energy to your system. This proves it on a pendulum, but you can do this in general, right, with this Lyapunov argument and show that it's going to be unstable over long time scales. What else is there to say about this? This Lyapunov stuff is super useful. It's super widely used in, in robotics stuff and control theory in general, um, generally to prove safety things. So you can prove your controller stable using this kind of stuff, right? Um, the gist of that is like, if I have, if I want to derive a controller, one move is to write down, make up a Lyapunov function for your system and do this and get B dot. And you can show, right, if I plug an arbitrary controller in, or I plug in a controller with some undetermined, you know, coefficients or something, I can like figure out what V dot is with the undetermined controller in there and then solve for the controls that make V dot negative, right? So then I can guarantee, basically I derive my controller by picking the controls that will make the thing we open off stable, right? So that's one way to go. You can also use the exact same theory and this whole like bounding stuff in the state space idea to derive safety guarantees for like keep out regions and stuff like this. And there's a whole bunch of stuff like this. If anyone's heard of uh, control barrier functions, these are like a thing last 10 years or so. They are literally this. They're like writing down some, some like bowl function around an obstacle say and proving that V dot is such that you'll never go inside the bad keep out region and you can derive controllers that will like always do that for you nicely and stuff. So useful stuff. And I think that's it for today. And we'll talk about more. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I did this. For yeah. Okay. My bad. Thanks for telling. I thought it was 1020 for some reason. Okay. So let's keep going. All that's still true. Still good. <laughs> the off and off stuff is, is good and useful. The key problem though is, here's the next part of the story. Okay, so basically the whole, the like Achilles heel of that whole Lyapunov thing is you have to have a Lyapunov function. And in general, those are hard to find. You have to have like a, you know, Rain Man insight to, to find those for really hard problems, right? Like these hard robotics things where I might want like to do some crazy safety guarantee thing. Like 
how do I make that thing up, right? Such that I can actually do it for some super gnarly complicated system. So we often can't find these. The same way we almost can never analytically solve the ODEs. We, we most of the time can't find the alpha functions. Um, but we'd still like to say something. Okay. Okay, so we're going to now, so the, the off and off stuff is super powerful because it's global, right? Like I can say, you know, for for the whole state space or for some region or whatever, I can like guarantee those things. Um, what we're going to talk about now is if I can't find a Lyapunov off function and I can't say anything global, I can still do local stuff. And when I say local, this is more general than you might you know think. Uh, we can do this uh, certainly around an equilibrium point. So like around the bottom of, or the top of the pendulum. Terrible. We can also do it though around trajectories. Um, so we can do this in like a sort of time varying tube sense around some trajectory, which is super useful in control. Um, we can also do it for orbits, like uh, periodic orbits. So if you have something that's periodic, you can actually do some cool stuff around that periodic motion as well to talk about the stability of a periodic orbit. Um, so the, the like vanilla, most common, easy version is to look at points. So we'll do that first. So let's do that. So what's an equilibrium point? in like our notation of state space, blah, blah, blah. Not the gradient, the the x dot, right? Which is not, not the gradient, but the time derivative, like your vector field or whatever, right? Um, it's your dynamics function, actually. So it's a, um, it's a point where you won't move, right? Which means x dot has to equal zero. And so it's literally a root of your dynamics function. So uh, for the pendulum we've been looking at, we have two of these intuitively. So we have x dot equals theta dot minus g over L sine theta. These both have to equal zero. So then we have x star x star can equal zero or, and then pi k, right? For multiples pi, that's where the sign will go to zero. And fancy notation for some, any integers k in there. Cool. And so really what we're talking about is we can have kind of the obvious theta equals zero case or the, sort of theta equals pi case. And obviously all other multiples of those, but those aren't different. Okay, so we know that, that's cool. Let's sort of try to get some intuition for, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the top, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I did that backwards, didn't I? You were right. Upside down, thank you. Okay, so let's try to get some intuition for like the, the picture here. So we're gonna look at a 1D system. When I say 1D, I mean 1D state space, not one degree of freedom. Uh, 1D systems are kind of weird. Um, so this means, you know, X is in R, 
or uh, on the line. So it turns out you can you can know everything there is to know about any nonlinear one-dimensional system. They're all like super benign. Uh, so and here's here's the sense in which this is true, right? Um, so we have the state space is actually just the line, right? It's x, that's it. And then we can on the y-axis we can plot x dot or f of x. And let's draw some random systems. So in this sense, right, like the dynamics of any 1D nonlinear system are just defined by this curve, right? Um, so let's draw some, some curve. Just going to make this up. OK. How many equilibrium points does this thing have? Three. All the zero crossings, right? OK. Let's draw those. Next question is the origin stable or unstable? So think about what happens. Think about the sign of f of x. If I move a little bit to the right, x is positive. f of x is negative. So x dot is negative. Which way am I going to go? I'm going to go back that way, right? OK. Now if I go over this way, x is negative x dot is positive, which way am I going to go? Right? Everyone see that? OK, so if I perturb a little bit, if I go a little bit to the right, x dot's negative, I'm going back this way. If I go a little to the left, f dot, x dot's positive, it's going to push me back this way. So small perturbations push me back to the origin. Stable. OK, let's look at this guy now. What's happening? If I go a little to the right, X dot's positive, I'm going to go farther to the right. If I go a little to the left, X dot's negative, I'm going to go farther to the left. So the like, you know, local sort of behavior in the neighborhood there is I'm going to go farther away. This is unstable. Same story over here, right? Go to the right, I'm going farther to the right, vice versa, right? So. Cool. So next question, if I, um, uh, okay, if I'm like anywhere in here, uh, so this next concept is like kind of a fun one, it's called Bacon's attraction. So like within what region will I end up at this point? That's the next question. You don't have to see that. If I start in, yeah. Yeah, so basically anywhere between here and here, I'm going to land here, right? I'm looking at the picture. And outside of it, I'm going to blow off, right? So you can define this region where So the origin has a basin of attraction, which is all the it's the set of you know the state space where if I start anywhere in there, I'm gonna up at that equilibrium point. If I'm outside of that, you know, all bets are off. Okay, so let's write some of this down, like kind of so looking at the picture, right? I can now say some pretty concrete things about this. I can say if df dx evaluated at x star, so this is the Jacobian or the here's the beginning, right? The basically the slope of f of x, right? If it's negative, which is the case at the origin, right? Then I'm stable. So if this is strictly negative, x star is locally stable. If it is positive which is the other two cases, right? Slope is positive. Then I'm going to blow up. And then this is the, the annoying weird case. So if I get that this thing is exactly zero, it turns out I can't say anything. That's inconclusive. And if that's the case, you have to do something nonlinear, AKA do some Lyapunov flavored thing. 
if this happens. And so we'll show examples of that, right? So like the reason you can't say anything, let's draw two. So I can have, for example, f of x equals x cubed about the origin. That looks like this, right? So it's flat at the origin. Is this stable or unstable? Hmm? Unstable, right? It's got it's positive over here, negative over here. And then I can do similarly, right? I can write down f of x equals minus x cubed, which will flip this around and go like this. Is stable or unstable? This one's stable, right? So these both have, you know, if the x equals zero at the origin at this equilibrium point, but they have opposite stability behavior. Yeah. Just to clarify this point. Yeah. Uh, is it completely unstable? Or... So these are both globally oh, unstable. Going back. Oh, sorry. In, in the case where you have the, 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 the yeah. It's like really strong enough to be completely unstable. Yeah, these are these are all local results, but this thing, this equilibrium point, if this is true, is hundred percent unstable. Like that's it. It's gonna go. You can't stay there. Right? That's kind of like what it means. So it's also unstable in this Lyapunov sense. Uh, it turns out that sort of unsurprisingly, maybe this is all. You can actually construct a local Lyapunov function. You know, based on this linearization idea. Um, this basically corresponds to having a quadratic Lyapunov function, right? Because when I take the gradient, I get a linear thing. Does that make sense? So, um, so, so in in some neighborhood like Taylor expansion style, small neighborhood, on, that's these are saying conclusively that things are unstable. And this one, you just can't say anything, and you have to do something more nonlinear. Here, if we have this one D thing and we can zoom out and look at it, eyeball it, you can tell, right? I could write a Lyapunov function down for these guys. And, say something inclusive in this case, right? But in general, if you've got some gnarly thing and you're doing this, this style of analysis and you end up in this case, you're kind of out of luck and you have to do something harder and, and fancier. And, you know, that can, that can be painful. Uh, yeah, so, and just to be super clear, both of these have X star equals zero and EF, EX evaluated X star equals zero. Okay, that is our discussion about stability stuff. Hopefully that was somewhat interesting. I think we're done for today.